Let's uh, get going. Uh, so it's great to be with people again and, and to have uh, some joining us uh, remotely as well as in the classroom. Um, uh, we're going to be continuing on this time um, discussing themes that we've been addressing the past few times, right? Um, uh, so we've been uh, speaking a great deal about uh, the use of CSETs or, or what are technically termed in category theory co-presheaves, but which which are named, uh, which are termed CSETs for the purposes of CAT lab and algebraic Julia. Um, and uh, you'll recall that these, uh, uh, a valuable perspective on these is, is when we have schema categories, right? And uh, the schema category encodes the sort of information uh, that we wish to uh, characterize. Um, uh, and we then, by having a functor that maps that to set or, or fin set, um, maps objects uh, in the schema category to what in set? To objects are mapped, uh, objects in the schema category are, are mapped to what in set? Sets. And morphisms in the schema category are mapped to functions in set. And because this is a functor, it honors what it preserves the preserves the structure and it preserves the structure by preserving what well composition right so so uh it honors composition in the sense that and probably another example from the dds schema here will be easier to see for this if we can either compose in the DDS schema and then map over, right? Compose next and next here and then map over or map over next and compose, uh, composed with the map over of next here, those functions, and we're gonna get the same function. So it honors composition. You can either do it here and then map over or map over and do it over here. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll recall that. And it also honors something else that's very important. What's that? It's the green thing here. It honors, what do functors Identities. honor besides composition? Identity. Identity, yeah. Be good with that? Okay. So this was the schema category for graphs, right? And by mapping it over, we have a set of edges or a finite set of edges, a, a set of vertices. And then we have functions, you know, that say for each edge, what's the source, which vertex is the source of that edge and which vertex is the target of that edge. Um, and uh, we're oops, uh, over here on the right, we're dealing with sets and functions, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and this allowed us like with graphs to encode graphs as sort of databases, right? We can we can think of like each of these sets here, the set of, of E, for example, as being associated with a table. The values of the set for edges are these sort of primary keys. And then we have foreign keys for each of these morphisms coming out for source and for target. We have a column here, right? And the value of those is kind of a form key. It points to some other table. In this case, the table of vertices um, points to an element in it. And here's the table of vertices. So are we okay with that? It's the idea of these C sets is describing a database. Just trying to make sure we can drive this in more, more fully. Yeah. Um, and last time we talked about homomorphisms, right? We talked about the structure preserving mappings between C sets that share a common schema category C. You good with that? So we have uh, mappings between graphs, right? This is a, is, is a C set, 
here. It's, it's sort of drawn graphically, right? But it's a C set mapping from the graph schema GR to set or consent. Um, this is another one of those. This is another so-called instance of GR. We say instance because it's a particular functor that's mapped it into set or been set. Are we good with this? This is one instance. This is another. <laughs> Each of them is a functor, right? The functor from this to this it preserves composition, it preserves honest identity, and it maps each object into a set and morphism into, into function. And a mapping between these functors is a what? Is a natural transformation. Do you remember that? And so for each morphism over here, like for source, there's a naturality square for source. Mm -hmm. so and like I, going either way around this composition square or this way um, uh, gives the same results, right? Mm -hmm. um, and same thing for target. So the notion of natural transformation comes along for, for each morphism in the source category, like our GR, schema category. We have to have this naturality condition be observed. And I, I want to highlight, and forgive me if for some this is so natural, but it's, it's worth reflecting on the fact that um, there's this notion to which we recurrently come back of kind of um, things being natural in, a, in even a vernacular sense that applies even for functors, right? Remember in functors, we said like, you can either compose things over here and then map over, or you can you can map over and then compose, right? It's, it's a similar flavor to what we're talking about for naturality, right? Um, we can either we can either go so this is one functor f this is one graph you could think of it right as another graph let's let's dive into the one for graphs right that here we are this is one graph with a certain set of edges a certain set of vertices as mapped over by that functor right e here mapped to this set how many edges are there here how many edges one V mapped to this set. How many vertices are there? Two. Mm -hmm. mm. So we can either, if we start here, consider an edge, we can either take its source, right? And ask, and that's a vertex, right? And it's a particular vertex in this graph. And so if we have an edge, we can take its source, mm, in this graph, F, and then map over to the other graph. Or we could take the edge, map it over to the other graph, and take its source. And those have to give the same result, right? So, so, so you get this flavor of, you know, the two have to be compatible. The two have to be, have this close natural relationship with each other. Um, here across all morphisms over here, across all morphisms in the source category. You have to have this. That's a very strong condition. Um, but I, I just want to highlight that it's it's easy to miss that that's basically the same idea with, with you know, with functions. You, you can either, with a function, you can either do things over here, compose uh, over here, then map over, or you map over and then compose. It's the same basic flavor to me that, that, and of course, functors are not natural transformations. They're very different. Natural transformation map one functor to another. But all I'm saying is that flavor of that idea thing comes through, right? It, it penetrates throughout. Okay. Now, here's the deal, though. Um, we needed to do this. Uh, we need to have this guarantee for each of these functions here. Are we good with that? Okay. Um, and yet, and I hope I tried, I hope I communicated this before. N these these natural transformations between these functors, which we call homomorphisms, these structure-preserving mappings between these structures, they 
they also have an intuitive feel to them that you can understand. Yes, you can unpack each into a bunch of naturality squares, but let's not miss the forest for the trees. So let's not miss out the big picture here as well. There's a really natural sense in which this kind of squishes down to be the same as that, right? Do you, do you see that? Yeah. And we, we, we talked about it, right? Um, and, you know, you want to watch out for certain mistaking certain things, like not, not forgetting that, you know, we need for this to be squished, for one to be squished to three, two, one to go to three, two to go to three, to squish these two down to three. <laughs> Um, we, we also need an arrow from three to three because one will now go from three to three, right? But the point is homomorphisms have this feel to them that's recognizable. We're embedding this and this, or we are, we are um, you know, coarse graining it. We're sort of glomming some things together, but preserving the structure. Do you understand that? We're not just willy-nilly sort of slapping it down. And same thing with graph homomorphisms. We might collapse, you know, uh, C and B here into B over here um, and keep A, but, but everything has to be done in a very consistent way, right? Um, so A02 has to go to, well, has to go to the, to capital B here, because that's where C got set to, right? So there are these these uh, these uh, notions of collapsing. Okay, so I hope this is reminding you of things, and we have the same thing with discrete dynamical systems, right? Remember we talked about this last time, these automata, that for it to be consistent, we either have to be able to be in the first dynamical system and then update, say we're in state one, update here and then map over mm -hmm, and get the same result as mapping over the state we're in and then updating over here, right? Same basic flavor. Okay, so I've been talking about these graphs, dynamical systems, but I hope you're seeing that this general notion carries over for C sets in general for these for these mappings from this to this. We need, we need that to be consistent for every morphism here. We need to be able to do that, in which case we say they have the same, it's a structure preserving mapping. It's a homomorphism. Well, now I'm gonna jump up a level. So we've been dealing with this at the level of individual graphs, right? Encoding particular graphs. I think you're comfortable with it. We went through a bunch of these in our exercises, right? And I won't, I won't go through those again. We went through a bunch of them in our code before. Remember that? Um, one by one, looking at these homomorphisms. But guess what? Category theory captures the context of things very generally. And you might you might think about that. Well, I'll, I'll say to you. Um, that each of these can be placed into a broader category, okay? And this is the category called GRPH. Excuse me, you are muted. Did I, did I just mute by accident? Yes. Just now, okay. Okay, did you hear that? Okay, we're looking at GRPH. This is the category of graphs. Each of these dots here, each of these objects in the category of graphs is a, guess what? A graph. And what are the morphisms between these graphs? Well, in general, morphisms are structure preserving mappings between objects. So what is this? What does a morphism here represent? If we have one graph here and another graph here, and we have a structure preserving map between them, we call it a what? Homomorphism. So that's what we've been studying, right? That's what we've been studying. It's one of these things, right? This graph is somewhere in here. One of these, one of these dots. I'm this, this is what Eugenia Chang might call a large, large category. 
for it. You know, it, it can have infinite number of, of graphs in it, right? This is one of one of these, those black dots is this graph here. But we're just collapsing them down to black dots and reasoning about the category structure here in general. Okay. Now, um, so that this is a category. And as a category, we look for certain features of it. Like in any category, each object needs to have a what morphism. Any category, each object needs at least one morphism. And what is that morphism? The uh, mm -hmm. identity. identity morphism. What would the identity morphism be? So if, if we had a graph, we have one graph, and we considered a homomorphism, one of these structure-preserving transformations of graph from itself to itself, what do you think identity would be? You tell me. So it would map each vertex to itself and each edge to itself, right? There's a notion of identity here. Now, let me ask this further. Let's suppose we had, and really, I, if I had more time and my druthers, I would have done it. Suppose we have a, a graph, a, a morphism from a homomorphism from this graph here, this here graph, do you see it? To this graph. And then suppose we had one from this to another one. Hmm? Could we compose them? To have one from this to that to that final one? The answer is yes. I'm, I won't show it here, but if we had this morphism to this one, and then we had another one that, to which this had a homomorphism, turns out we could compose them. Mm -hmm. And that rule falls under because it's a category as well. Well, yes, exactly. I mean, in a category, you can always compose these things. And so it goes along with it being a category. But I'm saying um, the, cat the fact that it is a category reflects the fact that you can compose any two end-to-end -end morphism. And, and that comes out of the nature of this, that you... that a map like this from one graph to another can be composed with another map to a, to a yet a third graph. So A to B and B to C yield something from A to what? To C. Do you, does that sound plausible? You you could work on it because, you know, each vertex maps to a vertex here, right? And then each vertex here is mapped to another vertex. And that's actually the same thing with the edges. So it kind of stands to reason you could compose them. After all, this is a function mapping from vertices here to vertices here, right? I mean, that's what this function is. Look at that, right? Mm -hmm. That's a function. That's a function because we're in set. Morphisms are functions, right? Mm -hmm. And you could even imagine extending another naturality square down here, <laughs> right? In which case you could compose these two and get a mapping, right? So... I hope that's plausible, but there's a category of graphs, okay? So the identity morphisms are identity homomorphisms. Mapping, you might think they're kind of boring. From a graph G to itself, G to G. Each vertex maps to itself. Each edge maps to itself. Does it honor the naturality condition? Yeah, it does. It certainly does. We okay with that? Okay, now, um, what would an isomorphism look like here? What do you think an isomorphism might look like? Remember an isomorphism from Eugenia Chang's book? So it's a, it would have bidirectional morphisms, right? So if we had graph G and graph G1 and G2, we'd have a morph, morph, a, high, a homomorphism from, what's that? Ah, okay, yeah. So you're talking, if you compose this one and you go back, you get what? Identity, right? Or in the other direction, you compose, you get identity. So they're inverses of another. Could you imagine that for a graph? 
a graph mapping to another graph that you go forward and then you go back and you get identity? Mm -hmm. What? Well, so so let's let's think about that a little bit. Why not? Why not think about that? Um, let's let's imagine creating a little situation where we have that if we could. Um, so let's let's just think if we could conjure up such a thing. Do I have a a nice instance? I do. Look at this. Look at that. Santa was working in his workshop. Um, okay. Um, okay, so if we had Santa's workshop is a busy thing. I'll tell you that. Uh, okay, so um, let's get Eric had a comment. Yes, Eric's. What, what's Eric's comment? Could someone read it? Yeah, any graph homomorphism where the um, source and target functions are both one to one and onto. Good. That's exactly right, Eric. Yes, excellent. Um, so yeah, if we have bijective mapping, right? Um, uh, between these. Okay, that, that was a build start. Um, okay, so. So maybe we have something like this. Here are some, here's graph one and graph two, right? And we have maybe this one. So so maybe this vertex goes for the for well, I'll draw one homomorphous. So so this is a graph, right? Um uh maybe maybe like uh this um mm -hmm. Mm, yeah. Um, and uh, well, okay. I'll um, I, I could I could easily create one where it's like this, this, and this, and where we have it. It's a k three three. So it's each of these has links to each other one, right? Um. Something like that. And there we go. And okay. Um so we could scramble like uh, this is a particularly simple one, but you know this one could go to this one, and and this one could go to this one, and this one could go to this one, and then there's a morphism back where this goes back to that, this goes back to that, and this goes back to that. I mean that that would be a particularly simple one, right? And and. Same, you know, follow through the obvious things with the uh, with the mapping of the uh, of these morphisms, right? Um, so if this went to this and this went to that, then this one from this to that has got to go to to this one here. So, okay, so this will be one example. But Eric's exactly right. If we, if we have it in uh, a bijective map, so it, the, the so we map uh, in a way between the vertices that we then get back to the same thing, and we're gonna it's gonna have to be a a homomorphism each way, right? So we're gonna have to map sources and vertices in compatible ways over, but we can get back to the original graph that we're in, right? And this is a particularly simple case, but. But uh, you can readily imagine um, uh, that there are cases which are, are a little bit more uh, textured than that, which is not a complete graph, but where things are mapped in ways that are compatible and isomorphic. So we can have homomorphisms here. What would a terminal object be in graph? What would be a what would be a graph? to which 
everything has a unique morphism. One vertex that has a self loop. Okay, one vertex which has a self loop. Right. And then every graph could map in the self loop to edge, self edge. Every yeah, self edge. Could every map. graph can map all vertices to the one vertex and all edges to the one edge. Exactly. Now, now that doesn't mean. It's a monomorphic map. It doesn't mean it's injective. It, it, you know, there's going to be many edges in general from another graph going to that same self edge. You know, we're we're talking about something of, of this form, right? Um, like like that. Um, and a given graph, uh, given other graph, might. Uh, if we had a, a graph up here with kind of very specific structure, um, maybe something like this. Um, so all of these guys are going to map down to this, all the vertices, all the edges are going to map down to the same edge. Uh, but there's nothing problematic about that it's good is it going to be unique yes it's going to be unique there's really no choice of the matter about where they go you have to go there do you do you appreciate that we have no other choice right um could there be an initial graph okay empty yeah so think what an empty would an empty graph have a mapping to every other graph. It has no vertices. Remember how many, how many, how, how yeah, huh? Can yeah. a single vertex be the initial? Well, then it wouldn't have a mapping to what? So a good question it was asked, could a single vertex be initial? That might be a candidate, but what would it not have a mapping to? The empty graph, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, but how many functions do we treat there as being from the set empty to any other set, including itself? One. One. It's vacuous. It doesn't need to specify any information. It's vacuously true. It's true without even trying, that it maps all elements of itself to at least one, to, to one, exactly one thing. If there's nothing map, no work to do, all right? And same thing, so, so in terms of mapping of vertices, there's one function. And in mapping of edges, there's a completely defined function because there's one vacuously true. And naturality is satisfied because for every edge, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, um, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, it, it maps, so, so there's an initial graph that's the empty graph. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so there is, uh, it turns out. Okay, now let's talk about dynamical systems. I think you may see where I'm going with it. Yes, for these graphs. This thing? Yes. For example, if in the uh, in if we have, for example, Hamiltonia, and the other side, I should have I should have Hamiltonia for other isomorphism. Every kind of graph should be the same. Well, they have to be. I think they need to be. The graphs need to be isomorphic to each other. So they need to have basically the same structure and same properties. Because um, otherwise you're not going to be able to go back to to, re, to sort of recreate those properties. But they, like, if I have um, in a graph, 
I could have one graph where, you know, I, I like it, they'll have to have exactly the same number of vertices. Otherwise, you're collapsing them down. You can't undo it, right? They're going to have to have the same number of edges, right? Um, and and this so the same structure. Mm -hmm. Now, could you say they're they're different graphs? Yeah, I mean, um, node one and one. You know, maybe you have. You know, if if I have a so with respect to graph isomorphism, sorry. Um, if if I had this graph, um, here, and I have this graph here, um, uh, right? Um, I could map. This one, oh, I'll put it in blue to, to be consistent. Hey, come on. Uh, um, I could map this one to this one and this one to this one um, and, you know, follow through with the appropriate edges. Or I could or I could do the opposite, right? Uh, alternatively, I could map this one to this one and this one to this one. Um, so there's not only one choice, but there is um, like these are isomorphic, right? Right. Um, and could you say, well, they're basically the same graph? Yeah, they're kind of basically in the same sense. Three elephants is the same as three professors, <laughs> right? Kind of the same. But um, category theorists tend not to get really worried once it's up to isomorphism. They say, well. Three roses smell by any other name smell just as sweet, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's really a matter of labeling, labeling things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so with dynamical systems, we we talked about homomorphisms there and the definition. And it shouldn't surprise you that there's a category of discrete dynamical systems. Each object here is a what? In this category of discrete dynamical systems, each object is a discrete dynamical system. The morphisms from object A to object B are what? Homomorphism, structure preserving mapping between them. What's the identity morphism here? For a given dynamical system, you know, something like this, what would the identity morphism, uh, the identity homomorphism be to itself? To itself. State would go back to states. states would go to their states and transitions would go to transitions and right. All right. Well, yeah, yes. I mean, it, it, it that's right. All we really have is is um, I mean, this is if if we you know so if this is the encoding of one right um uh yeah we would be preserving the states um you know one to one so each state would go to itself that's right when we mapped it right um remember this is kind of a way of re of mapping over the states remember this one oh sorry uh when we did this, remember this? We'd be, it'll be like on both sides here, we would have these. And one would go to one, two would go to two, three would go to three, four would go to four, and it would observe this property. Um, but it, it would just follow that it observes that property directly, right? Um, uh, and we, could we compose those things? Yes, we could compose them. Do we have these? these mappings. Um, it's just, again, extending this naturality square down here. Um, uh, and and is there a terminal object here? Well, you tell me, is there, a, is there an isomorphism here? What would an isomorphism be here For this one, let's say, give me one that's isomorphic to this. 
Well, well, that's isomorphic would just have different names for these states, but it would be corresponding respective names here, right? Like you could call the states one, two, three, four, five. And if this is one, the next to be one. If this is if this is two, the next would be sorry? Two. Would be three, yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So if this is one, this would be two. If, if this is two, this would be three. This is three, this would be four. If this is four, this would be five. And this one would go back to 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 two. Yeah. Yeah. Um so so we have isomorphisms uh here as well. Um yeah. Um sort of things again, the idea of an isomorphism is it's the same information, basically. You can go back and forth between either encoding. It's different ways of encoding the same base, same information. It's invertible. You can go from A to B and B back to A, you know, in terms of the representations, but it's basically the same information. Things play the same roles in each, even if their name is different. We good with that? Um, what would a terminal object be here? Uh huh. Okay, so if we have, if we have a, I think we have um, take home exercise two, right? And th this is the terminal object, right? Are we okay with that? What would the initial object be? Again, what was the initial object from the empty? I think it'll be an empty dynamical system, right? Next has nothing to update. It has no state to map. And so there's kind of a vacuous, unique map. Hmm. Right? Now, remember, if this mapped like if you tried to map this one to this, you might think, well, maybe this is initial as well. And there are ones where terminal and initial are the same. Well, so terminal and initial for some categories that are the same. And in fact, Eugenia Chang gives some examples where this is the case, but here it wouldn't, right? Like, cause a homomorphism to map from this to this, what would we need? We need to have what? Let's try, try to construct a homomorphism from this to this. This star would need to map to some specific state, and we'd need to have two things be the same. We have here, and we go across to the next, versus we go across, and then we update, right? Um, but that's not the, sorry, yeah. We go here, and then we map across to one, or we we uh, go uh, across and then we update here and we go to two. And those are different. Are we okay with that? Right? That's the, the idea of the naturality square. Do you remember that? With this naturality square we've been talking about? Uh, um, where is it? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Here it is. Um, the naturality square, right, for dynamical systems, right? Um, sorry, it's this one here, right? Um, we needed to either, if we were consider a homomorphism back this way from this one here, we would, we'd either go next uh, and in, this one here, get star again, and then map across. Let's suppose it maps to one. That would need to be the same as what? Mapping star across to one and then updating in the result, which would not be, would not be the same. So there's no homomorphism 
over to this. It's it's tempting. It's a good thing to look at. But what there is is if you have an empty, an empty one, an empty dynamic constant, there's no state. It's kind of vacuous that it, but just like in set, the empty set is the initial, it's initial. So for hmm. in that example, or even so for something to be if there was an object out there that was both a terminal and initial object, it would have to be isomorphic with every other piece of a category. And then it, that would hold true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It would. Where like a terminal right. object and an initial ob that's right. object that's right. are isomorphic with themselves, but those are, that's it. Um, That's true. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But that's, that's it. Right. So then for a terminal and initial object to if for there, it to be the one, it would have to be isomorphic with everything. everything. And not only isomorphic, but uniquely isomorphic, yeah. which is even a stronger condition. Because sometimes you could have multiple isomorphisms, but um, that would have to be uniquely isomorphic because it has to have, as initial, it has to have only one to any other object. And as terminal, it has to have only one back. So it would have to be uniquely isomorphic with respect to anything, any other object. Sorry. Yeah, and, and yeah, I mean, so being an initial object is a universal property of that object. It and for all the other objects, this is the past, right? With respect to that property, most extreme, the the quintessential one. It's, it's the initial one. All other objects, it's in that distinguished position. Um, and that's a universal property that it has. It's a universal construction. And in fact, it's it's a kind of uh, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, anyway, it's it's a universal construction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's close to related. The terminal object is closely related to the product. Um, it's, a, it's a limit, I think, and 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 the initial object is a co-limit. And um, but um, but yeah. Um, so so we have these categories for for dynamical systems, right? Um, and in general. Any C set has a category like this. What are the objects? For 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 this is for a fixed C, a fixed schema. Think think fixed schema, right? Like maybe the schema is graph, or maybe the schema is is uh, DDS, or maybe the schema is the stock flow schema, or maybe the schema is the causal loop schema. Or maybe the schema is the person schema for some agent-based model, right? I'm saying for any fixed schema, there is a category of typically unlimited numbers of these things where each object is a what? Fixed schema. It's a fixed schema. Each object is an instance of that C set, right? Like each of these might be a stock flow diagram. If this, if C is stock flow schema, each of these is a stock flow diagram. And what are the morphisms between them? Homomorphisms. And there's an identity homomorphism for every object. And there's a, there's a composition of these things. So if you take one stock flow diagram and you squish it down to another, or let, let's take it for system structure diagram, or take it for causal loop, right? If you have one causal loop diagram and you squish it down in a compatible way for the other, you preserve the signs for things, but you collapse some variables, right? Maybe you collapse some links, but you preserve their sign. You don't do something weird like collapse a plus and a minus to do the same one. You, you collapse a plus with a plus maybe, right? Right? Or maybe you just collapse the variables, but you keep all the pathways to it. If you were to do that, and then you were to do it again, collapse it down even more, you could compose them. Are we okay with this? Now, you may be 
Okay, so I'm going to make two remarks about this. First of all, first of all, um, you may be wondering, like, why in the world do we care about that? It's just, it's kind of, you may think this is a weird factoid. Okay, there's a category. What whoop de do? Like, what? Who cares if there's a category? Well, it turns out that this will be super important for the for parts of the class. And I'll tell you, it's in a category like this with stock with these being stock flow diagrams that we will stratify a stock flow diagram. Okay. We'll take pushouts, it turns out, in this category. Or or we'll take pull uh, for pushouts when we're composing stock flow diagrams, or pullbacks when we're stratifying stock flow diagrams. We will be working in this category to like combine stock flow diagrams, to glue them together, to stratify them. Mm -hmm. And we'll also want to know about these homo, I mean, like the homomorphisms are really interesting. I think about for a causal loop diagram, a causal loop diagram A, causal loop diagram B, basically depicting the same thing, but B is depicting it at a higher level. It's collapsed some distinctions, right? That's a very notion, natural notion, right? I bet Jenna knows some causal loop diagrams where, it, you know, one might collapse things down fruitfully, right? Um, and that's th that that's a very natural notion of a homomorphism. They're basically depicting the same thing, just one is coarser grained, hmm? or another one where this is embedded in this one. That's a type of homomorphism, right? It's it's found in the target. It's just, it's not all of the target. It's just a portion, right? It maps into, it's embedded in the target. Mm -hmm. These are very useful notions in this category. And we can do this for automatically for any CSET. But what I'm going to tell you now almost lit my hair on fire when I heard it on while well, walking in the august company of John Buys and and uh, the 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 Bunderkins of the Topos Institute um, on on Leith Walk, Leith Walk in um, in Edinburgh. So they told me any CSET. I'm not. I'm going to say some words that we're going to learn later. Any CSET. Mm, um, the the category of instances that C said is a topos. Okay. This is an incredibly rich structure. It's a, a David Spivak calls it a nice place to do math. It's kind of has set, it's like sets a nice place to do math. The category set. You know, sets and functions. But but why is it nice to do math? You have all limit, all finite limits among things. It turns out you can take limits among things. So you have things like, like terminal objects. You have things like products. You have things like pullbacks of every object. Every two objects, you can take their pullback. Every object, you can take their product. There is a terminal object. Uh, uh, and taking the pullback with it, basically, gives you something that's isomorphic with the original thing. You took it. It's like multiplying by one. Mm -hmm. um, it has finite co-limits too. So you have co-products, push-outs, all these sort of things automatically. But let me tell you something that shocked me. It has exponential objects. Now, you may say like, well, what the heck? <laughs> like, <laughs> that sounds wild. What's an exponential object? Does anyone remember from Eugenia Cheng's? What's it, what's an exponential object? It, let me ask in in something like Haskell or Scala. What is? Do you remember what objects are in the category Hask? They are what Type. types? And what's an exponential object? I think it's like types of types. It, it's it's a specific type. It's a it's a function type yeah. mapping from one type to the other. So the idea behind the exponential objects, get this, take a load of this. You ready? Okay, okay, just you know, keep yourself calm. Um, you, so if, yeah, b to the power a. If it's from a to b, 
it's b to the power a. So in a category that's a topos or a category which is exponential objects, we have objects that represent, get this, they represent every morphism in the category is represented by an object in that category. So just like in Hask, there's type int and there's type bool, but there's also a type int to bool, which is a function from int to bool, right? It's a type, it's a type, right? Haskell has types that represent the mappings from one type to another type, right? The, the, the type into bool, if, if you have an instant, if you have a variable of that type, it's some particular mapping from into bool. So we have exponential objects in any topos. So get this, check it out. Check this out. David Spivak said this, and it also almost freaked me out. Get this. So, so consider two graphs, graph A, graph B. Or call them graph G1, G2, okay? Okay, okay. The mapping from the homo... So what's... Remember, if we have G1 here and G2, what's a morphism between them? It's a what? Graph... Begins with H. Homomorphism. homomorphism. Good. A structure preserving mapping from G1 to G2. Are we comfortable with that? So what I'm saying is there is a graph in this category that represents mappings... <laughs> a particular mapping from G1 to G2. That's a graph. A mapping from graph one to graph two can be represented as a graph. There's a graph that represents each homomorphism between graphs. And it turns out that's wild, but it's true. You can draw out the graph that maps this one to that one. Okay? So... Ex having exponential objects means we call it a closed category, okay? And in fact, because it has, because it has a, a, all limits, it's a Cartesian closed category. Because we have exponential objects, we have objects that represent these morphisms between any two objects, we call it a closed category it kind of can represent its own morphisms. Hmm? In set, this is this true in set? That we have a set of functions from any set, from, you know, any set. If, if I have a set ABC and I have another set one, two, is there a set of functions from ABC to one, two? You bet there is, I can list them out, right? Hmm? In fact, it's like it's like it's like binary strings of length three, right? It can map a to zero, b to zero, c to zero, or it can map a to zero, b to zero, c to one, or it can map a to zero, b to one, c to zero, right? I can list them all out. There's a set of functions from from the set a b c to the set zero one, right? And what I'm saying is any C set has these exponential objects. It can represent its own homomorphisms in that category. Yeah. Now I'm I'm really interested in knowing what the causal loop diagram is that represent maps between <laughs> one causal loop diagram and another. Oh my god. Right? Huh? There there is such a cause of diagram. What is the stock flow diagram that represents the map from one stock flow diagram to another? Some particular, you know, map. There is such a thing. Um, do I have clarity about what that is? No, but could I figure it out just like we could figure out how to encode as a graph the map from one graph to another? Yeah, we, we could. Um, I don't think anyone's particularly thought about this right now for causal loop diagrams. It could be a fun thing for us. Okay, but let me say one final thing that the topos gives us, okay? The topos means that we can do logic in this topos. 
So a topos is a logical structure that allows us, it has sufficient structure to allow us to undertake what's called, and, and I don't understand, this is above my pay grade, I don't understand all the meanings of this, intuitionist higher order logic. So it has the ability to represent or, and, not, logical implication, there for all, there exists. You can represent that in this topos. Mm? It has what's called an internal language within this topos. Mm? Um, and that allows you to reason about and do logic on objects in this topos, like causal loop diagrams, if we had a causal loop schema, which is pretty interesting. Pretty interesting, eh? Okay, so these C sets, far from just being some weird thing we do with schema categories, it turns out like they have wildly powerful structure to them. And this is why a lot of mathematicians study so-called pre-sheaves. These are pre-sheaves or co-pre-sheaves technically, um, since it goes from C to set, not C op to set. But these are super nice properties. They're really nice places to do math and logic. And it turns out these things can be super useful. Mm -hmm. And we'll likely return to this in this class. Okay, so I wanted to, in terms of levels of abstraction, I wanted to return to that point that we have by virtue of the fact we have these C sets, we have homomorphisms, we can, I hope it'll be clear to you that you can apply this general enterprise to C sets more generally and you get super nice properties. Mm -hmm. and, and these properties are really useful. They let us do things like stratify a causal loop diagram or stratify a stock flow diagram or compose stock flow diagram or compose um, causal loop diagrams and take products of them. So if this group depicts this side with a causal diagram and that uh, this part of the problem and this other group composes that we could take the product of them and get a and get a causal diagram mm -hmm. we could take the co-product of them and say we'll consider this one alongside that you're either in one or the other what have you okay um I talked last time in terms of level confusions I, I just talked last time about needing when we're dealing with these different levels of understanding like we have a schema category and then we take maps out of it into set like that's that doesn't necessarily give something that particular instance doesn't necessarily have the properties of the original schema category like it doesn't have compositions so and we talked about this last time right um, just because there's a link one to two here and a link two to three in this graph does not mean there's an implied link one to three. This is not a category. This is a graph. And if you look at the homomorphisms here, there's a homomorphism, you know, that maps this edge onto that, right? Just shown here. There's one that maps this edge onto this, shown shown here. And then there's one that maps this edge onto onto to this. Uh, sorry, maps this edge onto this, um, both to here. Uh, but there's none that maps this one to one, two to three, and that somehow has a link all the way. No, that that isn't implied, right? Um, not unless we 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 need and you do extra work to to build it in. Okay. Okay. Uh, so are we comfortable with this? So far, okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna show you something that is so category has this amazing property that it's insanely beautiful and insanely useful. Also, okay. And I want to show you another thing. So one thing we've talked about is this. This is super beautiful, but it's super useful. You know these nice properties that it's a topos. You can do logic in it. Oh my goodness, you can represent. It, it's powerful enough to represent its own morphisms. Okay, I want to introduce to you another thing, and this is going to take some stretching, but it's called the category of elements. 
And there's a deep categorical structure here that I barely grok, but um, I'm not going to go into. I'm going to hit it at a pretty high level, but I want you to understand it as a useful thing and um, and to be able to take advantage of it and recognize because it's going to play a big role for us at a couple places, but including starting right now for depicting some of these C sets. Okay. Okay, so I think you're comfortable with the notion of a C set. We've been talking about them. You have some, consider this like a schema category here, right? Uh, this might be schema GR for graphs or schema DDS, right? Are we comfortable with that? Maybe this is part of the causal loop schema for all we know, right? This is like our category C. I should, maybe I should have called it C. By the way, these diagrams, I took a bunch from John Bies here as he explained it to us, Cheyenne and I, okay. So this is like our schema category and we can map it into set. Are you comfortable? Yes. So each object here gets mapped into a what? Into a set. Are we comfortable with that? Each morphism here gets mapped into a what? Function. Good. Are, 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 we, are we good with that? Okay. Um, um, now, this is set, right? This here is set. Mm -hmm. We know it's set. This is not some, I mean, maybe it's been set, but it, it's, 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 a, it's got a bunch of sets in it. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, I may be doing something borderline inappropriate here from a categorical standpoint, but the way I like to think about it is, okay. Okay, so let's, we, we know these are sets and we commonly treat them as dots, but Hey, between us as friends, we, we know within each of those sets there's some elements, right? Now, I, I, I want you to, to follow my reasoning here. This morphism maps to a what? To a, each morphism here maps to a function, function between sets, right? Now, what is that? What's the job of a function? What does it do? What It, it does what? The job of a function is to map what? Go to domain to codomain. And if we're to temporarily put aside our, our category theoretic view where we view each set as a dot and instead talk it as a bunch of elements, what does the function do? For each element at what? Each element in the domain. So like x1, x2, x3 here, do you see it? It maps to a what? It maps to some element in the codomain. Right? That's what a function does. It can't map this to multiple. No, 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 no. That, is, that wouldn't be a function. It'd be a relation. But it, it has to map it to someone here for it to be a total function. Are we good with that? So each element here is mapped over here, right? So what I've done, or what John did, <laughs> is he actually drew this picture, okay? And if it's good enough for John, it's good enough for me, <laughs> right? So he drew this picture um, for each element where it maps to with this function. Are we okay with that? I'm actually abusing this thing here. I'm, I'm explaining it in my crude way, but I'm a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit closer to having just learned this for the first time. So I, I have a lot closer, like a hundred or something. So I, I, um, I'm, I'm explaining my, my own way. Okay. So, uh, or, you know, in, in my own variant of this. So each object, so each element of this set, oh my gosh, I said it. Each element of the set is mapped over here to an element, to a particular element. Are we okay with that? And I've drawn an arrow showing how this function f of alpha maps this element, maps that one and that maps that one. Are we okay with that? Okay. Now, this is this is a category, right? And set, and this is kind of what's going on under the hood, right? If we're allowed to talk, it's kind of what's going on here with this function, right? Okay, so there's a thing called the category of elements, okay? Which takes, basically it erases, it's almost like it erases these, these, these things around here. Each of these elements in each set becomes an object in the category. So it's gonna be a category, L, so F is the, F is our C set, 
F is our C set, okay, capital F. Okay, F is our C set. And this category is called EL of F, the category of elements of, of F. So it's a category. What are the objects? Well, there are the elements of each of these sets that we're mapped to here, okay? What are the morphisms? Well, there are those things that were drawn here, where each element is mapped to by, by this function. So you agreed that each of these elements is mapped by this function, right? And those form the morphisms in this category. Each of these is the objects in the category, x1, x2, x3. Those are different objects. And because x1 was mapped by, when we mapped over alpha, it mapped to y1, it, it, that morphism is going to go from x1 to y1. Mm -hmm. So this function, f of alpha, which is a function from this set to that set, are we comfortable with that? Because alpha goes from x to y? f of alpha goes from f of x to f of y, right? That's a, that's a functor. Mm -hmm. Are we OK with that? So, so because this function map x1 to y1, now we have a morphism from X, the object x1 to the object y1 because this function f of alpha mapped element x2 to y1 as well. We have a morphism from x2 to, to y1, right? I'm not saying that morphism is a function. I'm saying that it, it's more, remember our categories. Remember what Eugenia Chang said. She showed us many categories, like pre-order categories, where either there is or is not a morphism from A to B, right? Morphisms don't have to be functions. Morphisms could say A is less than or equal to B, right? Yeah? A morphism could, from A to B could say A is, divides B evenly. Do you remember that from her example? It could say B is higher in the social a higher social status than A, a higher in income or something. So morphisms mean different things. I'm not saying that these are functions, but I'm saying there's a morphism from object X1, which came from this element of this set over, okay, to this. Now you may say like, what the heck? Like this is the wackiest thing. This is a wackadoodle you might think, but it's super useful. And it's actually beautiful and it's super important, okay? So I'm going to show you something that I've been glossing over. And I'm going to learn you something. Ready? Can I learn you something? Hearing no objections. Um, okay. So we've been talking about encoding dynamical systems, right? Do you remember this? So... With dynamical systems, this is a D, uh, an instance of the DDS schema. Do you remember that? What is DDS? How many objects does DDS have? Just as a sanity check. The, DDS, the schema DDS, how many objects does it have? One. One. Right. Right? One beautiful object. Right? How many morphisms does it have? Well, it has identity. And then as next, but actually it has many more, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So this is this is going to be our our DDS. This is going to be an AC set, a mapping from that to set. It's going to have two set states. The first is going to map state one to what's the next going to be? State two, and two is going to go to one. Okay. This is an illustration of the category of elements for that schema. Each of these states turns into a what? Each of the elements turns into a what? It, each of the elements in the category of elements, each of these elements in this set turned into a what? It became an 
in the category of elements, each element became, uh, each element in the set became an, begins with, oh, an object, an object. This is an object. This is an object. What is this? What is this thing here? It's the morphisms between that object. Like this is, this is the set of states. This is the same set of states. And this morphism says where this state maps to in the next time point. Mm -hmm. And that's what's shown here. This is state one, state two. State state one goes to state two in the next one. Next, and state two goes to state one and then so this is the depiction of this that by the category of elements. Let, let, how about this one? There are four states. State one goes to, so if you're in state one, you go to what? State two. Mm -hmm. If you're in state two, you go to state what? Three. If you're in state three, you go to state one, right? Um, if you're in state four, you go to state three. I just kind of drew it out here when I presented to you in that exercise, but this is what, this is what it is when you view it as the category of elements of this. What is this thing? This is a C set. That's what we're creating. It's a C set, the C set here. This is the category of elements of the C set. Each of the states turns into, or here, yeah, each of the states turns into an object. Each of the mappings from one state to the next, to where it goes next, is a morphism. And that's exactly what's shown here. This is a category. It's a wild category, but it's a useful category. Do you see that? So we're depicting the structure of a C set. And we're doing this totally generically. This is not because it knows about DDSs. No, 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 no. We, we haven't programmed it to know all about dynamical systems. No, this is a, this is a C set. It's mapping into set and each, each element of each of these sets turns into an object and the mappings between them from that are defined by the functions resulting from mapping the morphisms over turn into morphisms in this category of elements. Do you see that? Okay, so what I'm saying is the category of elements provides us this way of visually seeing the structure of a C set. And for dynamical systems, it's just what we want. Look at that. That's our dynamical system. Now, truth is I'm 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 trying to put its best foot forward because sometimes what's depicted is not always the prettiest of things. Take a look at this one. I pondered whether I should depict this. So this is a four state thing where state one goes to what? If you're in state one, you go to state two next, right? If you're in state two, you go to state what? If you're in state three, you go to state what? If you're in state four, you go to state one. one. So what is it? It's a nice what? Cycle, right? But this is how it turns, <laughs> this is how it's depicted when you say to graph is, Display this wonderful. It's a bit tangled. It's a, it's, it looks kind of tangled, but I think you can imagine. It, you know, you can. I can hope for a circle. When it looks like you, glass. If 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 only you could tell, like, drag it up there. Don't go there. Go go up here. Don't cross, Don't cross arrows. Yeah, but but this is a cycle. It just shows it in a somewhat less artful way, but you can see. It captures the structure of it, right? Each of the states, right? It says two elements here. Sorry, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that example. It says four elements. So each turns into a what? In the category of elements. Each of these four elements turns into a object in the category of elements. Each of the maps 
from these objects to the next turns into a morphism here, a unique morphism. Same thing with this one. Hmm? Okay, now you may say, well, okay, that's kind of nice. I can depict C set schema. I mean, C sets is kind of nice. It, it is nice, yeah. But I'm going to fast forward for a moment and at the cost of of giving you, you know, spoiling the spoiler alert, um, I'm going to show that these things are center stage later this semester. Guess what? These things are the category of elements. This is the category of elements. Each of these. So each there's there's a, a set of people. Right, or this is in the schema. It maps over into set to be two people, one, two. That turns into a person. Each person, right, uh, has a certain infection status that turns into each of these, right? An antimicrobial resistance of somebody is associated with a person. That's what this morphism is. Right. And if the person had more than one, if we, if we were keeping track for, for more than one drug, we might have AM1 for that person, AM2, AM3. And 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 then it has a drug associated with it. That's what that these are from the category of elements. The category of elements is going to be absolutely central for us. Like this is going to depict, okay. Um, oh, this is in the schema category. Each person has a home and they have an age, which is a, which is a uh, attribute. And the category of elements will have how many people are there in this in in the set map to by the C set. The set map to it maps to some set of persons. If this is the category of elements, how many persons are in that set that, to which this maps? This is a category of elements for some particular C set. In that C set, how many people are there? Two persons, right? In that C set, how many homes are there? Home one, home two. And each of them has an age. I'm, I'm not, uh, we're going to be getting to these attributed C sets soon, but I'm not going to comment on them. But you can read off the encoding kind of of this using this category of elements. And you'll notice, just as I said, each person has a home. This person has that home. That person has that home. Mm -hmm. So the category of elements, as bizarre as it seems, as strange beast that it may be, at first glance, it's a beast both wondrous and offers high utility. Okay, that's like what it lacks in poetry, I think it conveys in passion. Um, so it's a beast of wondrous uh, beauty and power at once. And it's going to be helping us in our work with these modeling types as kind of a tool we use. Okay. Um, and it's very useful for depicting the structure of C sets. But it's also going to be super useful when we are dealing with pattern matching. So, are we okay with this? Okay. Okay. Yeah, for a functor into set. Yeah. And it's a it's a, it turns out there's a, it comes out of what's called, so when we have a functor, a co sheaf, a CSAT, we have a category of elements of that functor, and it lets us know what that CSAT encodes. Yeah, a structure of it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's in that CSAT. Absolutely, including the mappings, right? Each person has a home, right? For example, each person has a service dog. Mm -hmm. So it lets us see that structure. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it, it's a, it, it turns out it's closely 
it's sort of uh, closely related to and probably a particular yeah it's it's related to what's called the growth and deconstruction which is um yeah i'm, I'm not going to comment it's kind of above my paper anyway um yeah this um it's a very useful thing okay are we good with this okay i may ask you to apply this um now next time we're going to be talking about causal loop diagrams several different ways of encoding them and we're going to introduce attributed c sets c sets where we can have names to things and we can give people like real number based ages without having a table of all possible real numbers and table of all possible names for causal loop diagram variables etc okay we good with this? Okay. I think I will I will stop here.